Good afternoon, and uh, thank you. I seriously thank you for your civic engagement. Uh, this is what it takes. My name is Joe Gallegos. I don't have a sign, so I need to tell you. My name is Joe Gallegos, and I'm the uh, representative for House District 30, which is Hillsboro, North Plains, a little bit of Aloha, and a couple of houses in Beaverton. So that's my district, and uh, I'm sticking to it. The um, you know, just some background, I, you know, I think a number of you, you heard my story, but basically uh, I am a lifelong Oregonian. My parents came here to Portland uh, from Texas to work in the shipyards during the Second World War. And the way they worked it, uh, basically they would work during the year and then they would um, leave their jobs and the whole family would uh, essentially work in the fields. We did farm work. Uh, we were initially sort of the first, among the first uh, settled out farmer, farm worker, migrant families. So as you can imagine, uh, I would get pulled out of school early to work strawberries up in banks, and then oftentimes get to school late because of uh, working the hops up in Yakima. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was, uh, you know, family dysfunction alcohol, domestic violence. So it was a, it was a rough uh, childhood. As a result, I went to 10 different grade schools. I was labeled a problem learner. And with that label, I responded in kind with uh, delinquent behavior, a truancy, and, and all that goes with it. So it was, it was kind of a rough start. And uh, it wasn't until high school that I got turned around. I, I, I was lucky. I was very lucky. I, I hooked up with a school counselor and a teacher who took some interest in me. And lo and behold, I started getting good grades. And, and with that, there was this little spark of belief that, gee, maybe I could do something other than what my parents had been doing. So with that belief, I got through high school. I, I went and enrolled at Portland State. I had this belief I could go to college, for crying out loud. <clears throat> and the... Um, the day for school to start, though, I got there late. The, I got to Lincoln Hall, and the bell had rung. And I didn't realize that you could still go into a classroom after the bell rang, I mean, which is kind of the norm now, right? But uh, so I, literally, I swear, I, I stood outside that classroom door for 20 minutes, not knowing what to do. What I did was I turned around and went home. Uh, we were just starting the war in Vietnam, and so I enlisted in the Air Force. I thought, well, they'll give me a career direction, right? So here I was, they, they, the, the, sending people to Vietnam, they sent me to upstate New York. So, so uh, wisdom of the federal government, right? So the, uh, the, the uh, excuse me, the upshot of that was that I found uh, a box of books that had fallen off a truck. And this box was a box of books. And, and you gotta appreciate, there was no reading in my family ever. But I was so lonely in that barracks room by myself. I started reading these books, and, and I swear, I've never stopped reading since then. So I got, a, I, I got a hardship discharge after a year to come and take care of my folks. Um, went back to work in the shipyards myself. I spent 10 years as a boilermaker working in the shipyards. While I went to community college, to get back to school. And I also completed my military service with the Oregon Air National Guard. So, you know, while I spent 10 years doing those three things, uh, I have to say that uh, it was a stack of books that sort of changed my life again. Through the, G through the GI Bill, I went on to earn a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, and even a postdoc. I went from a kid in the fields to earning a doctorate because a stack of books fell off of a truck. But an education should not be a matter of luck. 
I want to make sure now that today's students have opportunities to build strong, successful lives for themselves. That's why in my first term I advocated for increased funding for Oregon's K-12 schools, increased access to affordable college education through my aspirations to college bill, and supported local employers and, lo and small businesses so that we can keep good paying family wage jobs in Oregon. We made great progress these last two sessions, but we still have a lot of work to do. <clears throat> we need to continue to respond to the needs of small business and this changing economy. We need equal pay for equal work. We need family wage jobs throughout the state. We need access to affordable higher education and policies that fortify a healthy and educated workforce. We need to continue to invest in our K-12 schools to shrink class sizes, to restore school days so that every student has a fair shot at building a productive life for themselves. I want to return to Salem to continue the fight to ensure working families have opportunities to get ahead and to make sure that for today's student, for today's students, an education is not a matter of luck. Thank you. Mr. Mason, come on up. You might want to stay up here after your remarks because then you'll have the two to rebuttal and the questions. So uh, come on up and you've got, you've got till um, eight minutes, five to eight minutes. Take your full eight minutes. You want. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Um, really appreciate that conversation that you just shared. You truly, Joe Gallegos uh, has an incredible story that truly should be honored. I mean, he's got a real life success story. Um, I want to introduce uh, my wife who uh, ended up showing up today, Jacqueline, she's in the back. We just celebrated our uh, four month anniversary. We're, uh, so we were going to pass around the plate and have uh, you all put your wisdom bits of uh, good marital advice, you know, right off uh, as a new couple starting. Um, do we have any uh, Democrats in the room tonight, today? Okay. They, I really wanted to talk to you because I grew up in a Democrat family. Now I'm a Republican. I grew up in a Democrat family. My grandparents were Democrats. My great grandfather was an FDR guy. Uh, my aunts were were uh, Democrats. Um, I ended up a, a Republican, my stepdad, because we were watching Ronald Reagan, uh, who uh, made me feel good about the country and the presidency, and uh, he was last bipartisan president, I believe, because he won 49 states. But uh, I never tried to uh, get, get my grandma <laughs> to become a Republican. No, I, I was, I, we were having honest conversations, and, and I respected her p uh, political positions, and I honored them. And the same with you know, all of my family members. Um, my uh, government teacher, who's also my basketball teacher, hardcore liberal Democrat, uh, taught me some great things, some amazing things. And I'm friends with him to this day. I actually graduated high school uh, outside of the big city of Roseburg, if you guys know where that is, uh, in Glide. And so John Kitzhopper, when he was a state senator, he would come out and speak at my uh, teacher's class and talk about civics and all of that. And so, uh, as you can imagine, my government teacher was very hardcore uh, support of the Democrat Party. And I share all of this because um, I think there's a, a negative discord between both parties right now. And I, I experience it on the door a little bit. There's some folks that uh, aren't necessarily open to uh, listening to a Republican viewpoint or even having the conversation. Uh, I think Joe might have bumped into uh, you know the opposite party, maybe not even treating him as as properly as he probably should. Um, but the point of all this is, is we've got to honor and respect that conversation. We have to be able to honor and respect those d diversified opinions. Because right now, the most unpopular group in the United States is, is Congress. We, and, but, it, but it, at the end of the day, it starts with, it starts with us. I mean, it starts with us being able to have this type of conversation. I want to be able to talk about economic development, transportation, housing, and school funding, because these are vital issues that we got to address at the legislature. But if we can't have Democrats and Republicans, obviously non-affiliates, having this type of conversation where we honor and respect other people's viewpoints, and we are open to hearing about where these folks are coming from, 
we, we can't get to where we need to go. At the end of the day, if you want a more bipartisan country, it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with us listening to other candidates rather than going completely down the slate for one party, but being open. Because I've had conversations with some folks who said, um, you know, I, I am Dan Mason, running for state representative for your district. And the gentleman says, well, so what party are you from? I'm a Republican. Ah, we've already made up our mind. Okay. Fantastic. We'll keep, we'll keep going. Unfortunately, folks need to be, they need to be more open to having these type of conversations. Um, and I'm opening it up because I think that's a paramount issue of the day. Um, I know we're going to do a Q&A here in a few moments, but I just wanted to end my opening remarks. Uh, since my uh, wife is here, and she was named after Jacqueline Kennedy with a JFK quote. Let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democrat answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. The future is ours. We make up it, and we need to work on it together. Thank you. Sorry, as, as you might know, during these kinds of times, I'm <clears throat> just still trying to get down my lunch. But lunch doesn't get in the way of uh, work. Uh, my understanding is that the format is to have a couple of minutes to rebut or, or to sort of follow up on comments. And I, I do uh, very much agree and, and, and appreciate the comments about um, needing to uh, be able to, to, to be more moderate with regard to how we approach some of these problems. Uh, what I can tell you is that in 30 years of being a professor, what I would tell my students is I do not want them to be knee-jerk liberals nor did I want them to be right-wing radicals, but I want them to be critical thinkers, critical thinkers. And that's what I tell folks on the door as well. Um, so yes, I think that, that uh, bipartisanship and, and an effort to, to uh, get things passed is really critical. Bills passed, I should say. That is very much why I went down to Salem. If you recall, the previous uh, uh, legislature was 30-30 split. 30-30 split, and uh, this last time we had 34 Democrats in the House, and that enabled us to get some things moved. Uh, but even then, uh, clearly I was, uh, most of my bills were very bi bipartisan. Um, my aspirations to the college bill also had a number of Republicans on that bill as well. And uh, so, yeah, well, I'm asked to close. Thank you. I would say uh, in any given legislative session, there's 2,500 bills that are introduced and over 800 signed into law. A lot of folks that don't pay attention to the legislature would be shocked to know that. 800, over 800 bills are signed into law by the governor. Um, so how do you make the priorities on what we're gonna focus on? I think in Washington County, you gotta have a major focus on economic development and transportation as your, as your highest priorities, because that's how you get to fund the actual government. I mean, but you gotta have jobs creating the tax revenue, because really in our current revenue model for the state, all the revenues derived by income tax, property taxes, and corporate taxes. Well, if you don't have companies that are here that are hiring, hiring folks, you do not have the revenue base to fund education properly or to do all the different things with regards to transportation. Anybody sat in Highway 26 traffic lately? A little rough? <laughs> it's, it, it's a rough deal getting around. We be, need to be able to uh, move goods and services throughout uh, the, the county and the state. So I think that number one, one of the biggest priorities in the 2015 legislative session is going to be a transportation package. And I think that we need to make sure that we have uh, legislators that are fighting for those dollars to make sure they come to Washington County so we can get Highway 26 expanded, some of the other road access uh, abilities through uh, um, Cornelius Pass Road, um, I know right now it's a two-county road. It would be nice to have it a state highway so we can adequ uh, adequately fund it, um, take out some of the curves, make it better for all the trucks moving goods and services out of the county. So I think that uh, those are the highest priorities of the legislative session in 2015.
Thank you. Uh, actually, that please close isn't like the Gestapo. That are gonna, nobody's going to come yank the phone. We just wind it up. Questions? Questions over the forum members only. Uh, basically, that please close works for the folks asking the questions um, more than the people answering. So. I, so I see folks lining up here. We're going to truncate it somewhat. I think um, Cody's going to get his question in, and the next person's going to get their question in. Uh, but we have, we're working with a, kind of an hour format either way. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Packer, forum member, and I'd like to uh, thank you both for coming today. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Mason what is your viewpoint on raising the minimum wage here in Oregon? Thank you for your question. Right now, Oregon has one of the most aggressive minimum wages because it's tied to inflation. So I think it's most the most progressive um, as of right now. And so I think that um, out of the two states, we have Washington and Oregon that have a similar model, which is completely different to the rest of the state or the rest of the country. And I think that right now, unless uh, we vote um, to uh, increase it, that uh, it's pretty progressive as of now. I support the current uh, progressive uh, minimum wage situation. What I would say about that is that 2008, the re Great Recession, the median income was $55,000. Today, it is $8,000 less. Medium. That means all of us, all of us have $8,000 less in our pocket at the end of the year. And you'll notice that when you go to the store to buy hamburger, when you go to buy milk, when you buy gasoline. We need to inflate and, and get the wage back up again so that we have living wages for folks. So that, that's what I would say. Thank you. I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. Again, thanks you both for coming in today. Uh, th there's talk about uh, the tax code, you know, about going in and changing taxes and altering them. Um, we've tried that a number of times with the sales tax and, and also the kicker and things like that, the whole realm. I was just wondering if you would talk generally about it and maybe where you stand on, on taxes. Appreciate your question, Bill. With Oregon, you have a revenue model that unfortunately hasn't been working throughout the last so many decades. We've tried to pass the uh, sales tax nine different times. It's been rejected nine different times. So it'll be interesting with the governor's tax pro uh, proposals what that will entail. What does tax reform truly entail? And I know there's been an article with Mark Hass, Senator Mark Hass, and what he specifically is going to offer. So I think it, it's going to be hard. Whatever tax proposal occurs with changes to the current code, um, it needs to push job creation. It needs to entice other employers and small business people to grow their business, which the current tax situation does not. Um, and we need to be able to have stable revenue to be able to fund schools long term. So when ma the majority of your revenue is derived by personal income tax, state income tax, corporate taxes, and when you raise those taxes, you increase people to leave the state uh, or move their businesses out. We need to change that attitude and make sure that we are attracting businesses here to be able to drive that revenue up, to be able to fund all of our public services that we need. Hi, I'm Marilyn McWilliams, forum member. And I have a question for Dan Mason in particular. Um, Dan, I met you two years ago when you were canvassing in Cedar Hills for House District 34. I think you remember the day. <laughs> And um, I'm just curious, now you're running for House District 30, uh, would you contrast the kinds of problems and issues that you see in House District 30 that might not have been in 34? Sure. Well, I appreciate that question, because uh, in Washington County, I've managed a community uh, where over 500 residents live at any given time. And so I've seen over 10,000 residents in over the decade that I've been in that position. And I've noticed you know, in, in, in all of our entire area, they all have issues with, you know, um, being able to pay their own bills, being able to pay their rent, make their house payment, being able to just have affordable living. Um, they have issues with paying for their school. Baby boomers that uh, can't afford to make it. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of baby boomers selling their houses 
and downsizing into apartments because they didn't afford, they can't afford uh, their their lifestyle. They, they they don't have a retirement, and so those issues are universal throughout Washington County. They're universal throughout Oregon. And I think we need to have a collaborative effort to continue to look for problems or to look for ways to solve these problems because they're not going away anytime soon. Thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Gallegos. Um, during the special session, the House passed a PERS reform bill, which you voted against, um, which would have put more money into the school district and into law enforcement. Do you regret casting that vote? No. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, seriously, uh, I voted uh, yes the first time around, mainly because it was a fair uh, effort to achieve a, a, a fair sort of resolution to the PERS problem. And uh, also, it, it had at least some, some guarantee that the cost that we might incur, should we go to court, as we did, could be recouped. The second time around, there was not that kind of fiscal assurance, and I just thought it was too risky. And literally, I went against my caucus and voted no to that. My question is for Mr. Gallegos. The current representative in this district had some public battles with the county commissioner <coughs> over gain share in the strate strategic investment program. Commissioner Terry went so far as to accuse him on the record, working very hard to kill gain share down in Salem this year. How would your views differ from Representative Unger, and do you think gain share in strategic investment programs are a good thing? I know Representative Ben Unger, and I am no Ben Unger. <laughs> Seriously, the, you know, uh, my district, District 30, is very different than District 29. And literally, Gain Share, uh, Intel, Genentech, the high tech industries are located in my district. So, you know, I take a very different position. Um, I'm supportive of Gain Share, I'm supportive of the SIPs. Uh, what I am concerned about, though, is to I, I just want to make sure that our schools do not suffer because of that equation. So that's, that's what I would continue to advocate on behalf of schools and make sure that our schools are getting their fair share. Thank you. Hi, my question is for Mr. Gallegos as well, so you can just wander back on over. Speaking of fair share, um, do you think Oregon businesses pay their fair share, and if not, how much? Uh, good question. Uh, I think that... Our small businesses <clears throat> are critical to our environment. <clears throat> it is our small businesses that, that, that create j jobs in our state. And so I think that uh, we need to make sure that we're uh, supporting our small businesses. I think the, the question of the corporations is, is another whole different discussion. And uh, as I said before, I support the SIPs. And I think we're going to see more of those kinds of, of agreements throughout the state if they're bringing jobs to our, our, our state and raising the economies within our particular rural communities. However, again, as I said, I want to make sure that the equation, the arrangement, is not detrimental to our schools. Thank you. I would ask all forum members to state their name because we banner the questions on there. So, One more for Joe. Hi. I do income taxes. I have a tax question for you. Okay. My name is Catherine. Measures 66 and 67 were narrowly approved by voters in 2010 to raise taxes on household incomes of 250,000 or more, raise the corporate minimum tax, and establish a gross receipts tax on business. How did you vote on these? Would you do the same today? If I recall way back then, I was not in the legislature, but as a voter, I voted against the raise. I, you know, I, I think that, that uh, we need to find ways in which we can uh, support, as a, again, the schools and our business and so on. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I voted against the 66-67 uh, measure and uh, was happy to do so. I was. I don't think it was positive for. Um, a lot of the small, certain businesses, and I think you have saw some of them relocate out of Oregon as a result, unfortunately. 
We have some time for more questions. Again, this is a TV show, even though um, I don't have the resemblance to some of the game show hosts that you've seen. They're thinner, younger, and funnier. Um, this is a TV show, so the reason we ask for folks to give their name is because we're actually, we may banner their headlines or underneath there. So we have five minutes left for questions. Um, I think we've got it with Mark and with um, our erstwhile forum member who needs no introduction. Mark Kreiber, forum member. Actually, just to keep the discussion going, uh, I just wanted to see if um, Mr. Mason would like to reply to any of the issues that were raised in some of these questions, uh, just generally about uh, SIP and gain share and a few others that you were not asked about. I think the SIP and gain share is crucial for success in Washington County. It's the, probably the number one job creation entity you know, in the history of Oregon, if you look at the numbers. Uh, I think that uh, you've, there's some folks who say that uh, Intel shouldn't have got that tax break. They shouldn't have got that benefit. From my understanding, though, the Intel pays full taxes on land and buildings. And th that was crucial to have that incentive to continue their growth here in the state of Oregon. Uh, the gain share entity, and I agree with Joe, you got to make sure that you have uh, the local schools funded properly and have that revenue coming back into our local entity. And so the formula with regards to gain share um, I may go through some tweaks, but we need to make sure that Washington County gets the biggest chunk of what we have been giving up, theoretically, with uh, the strategic investment program. Chris Leslie, forum member. On transportation, is there any study being done on drones, like the Amazon idea of, uh, so we won't have so much traffic? No. <laughs> but it's not a bad idea, and, and the legislature will always entertain uh, good ideas, so hopefully you might write that up and submit it to us. Thank you. Uh, while I'm up here, though, I, I will say something else about the SIP business. Um, you know, the numbers that I've seen are numbers that Intel paid for. They basically paid for the study, and those are the numbers that you see most often quoted. Um, I've had some constituents who have come up with some other numbers, uh, but what I would like to see is a nonpartisan study that would really give us the bottom line, really pencil out, you know, what is this costing us, how much is it costing us in terms of our schools, and so on. I might add, you both forgot the employees that pay taxes. Um, this is a citizen legislature, and our two citizens here have um, expressed their views very well, and so we should give them a round of applause as they head back to their seats. And um, we've got, um, I believe, Senate District 15, the incumbent is um, Senator Bruce Starr, and for both um, Mr. Riley and Mr. Starr, we have some water there, so you don't have to bring your order up. But uh, in any event, Mr. Um, Bruce, Senator Starr is an incumbent in this district, and um, he's running again. And I usually don't introduce folks just for a simple matter that they can do it themselves. I will note that, again, you've got five to eight minutes, but the questions don't have to be on camera. So basically, we can have questions after 1 o'clock. But Mr. St Senator Starr, if you'd like to come on up and introduce yourself. And this is, this is not the Gestapo speaking. This is 30 seconds, and you can wind up. We're not, there's no hook here. Perfect. Well, I'm pleased to uh, be with you this afternoon. Washington County is a special place. It's a special place to work, it's a special place to live, it's a special place to raise a family. And I would suggest that it's special not by accident. I would suggest that it's the kind of place to re where we live, where we work, where we raise our families because, and we want to stay here because of the leadership that we have here in Washington County. It's not by accident that uh, we have Intel's largest footprint anywhere in the world here in Washington County. It's not by accident that they invest six billion dollars in Hillsborough. It's not by accident that during the uh, height of the recession, uh, one of every two tradespersons in the state of Oregon was working in, in Hillsborough on those Intel projects. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to represent um, Western Washington County. And I believe that um, you look at the collaboration between all of the levels of government that we have in, in and I would suggest in Western Washington County, though it's true, uh, I believe in, in 
say, Beaverton and Tiger and, and those places that I don't represent. But you look at the leadership in, of, of the county level and the city of Hillsboro, um, and it's, it's, it's leadership that works together and collaborates um, and makes sure that we continue to have a kind of community, a kind of, a kind of county where I hope my children will have the opportunity to come back and have a job have an opportunity to come after college, come back to uh, Western Washington County and raise their family. That we'll leave this place, this great place, in, in, a, in a way that's better than we found it. Those are the issues that drive me in my public service. C creating that economic opportunity for not only the current generation, but the next generation of Oregonians. Making sure that we have a transportation system that works, that effectively moves people, effectively allows our businesses to move their products that we have an education system that is uh, well-funded, that provides flexibility for teachers and families and administrators so that they, they don't necessarily have to just jump into one particular one-size-fits-all situation. That we have our communities that are safe so that um, when we have violent offenders, that we make sure that they're locked up, that they're, that they're uh, behind bars and they're not in a situation where they're back on the streets right away. And those particularly violent predators, let's make sure they stay locked up for a very long time. And I see my, my friend, Representative Barker here, and he and I collaborated in a big way on Jessica's Law. Um, I don't think without, um, without the work that we did that that would be law today. Those are issues that are important to me, and those are issues why um, I work hard to represent Western Washington County in a bipartisan fashion, reaching across the aisle with my Democrat colleagues, finding places that we can collaborate and work together. But the most important thing is that we have uh, an economy that works. I think that those are, those are issues that, I, as, I talk to, um, as I talk to my constituents, my neighbors on their doorstep, they're worried about jobs, making sure that they have jobs that, that are available to them. Uh, making sure that um, as we work in Salem that we, we are careful of the um, unintended consequences of bills that get passed. There's a lot of talk about a lot of different things, but um, if you look, unfortunately, too many times, they have a negative impact on the middle class, negative impact on moms and dads who are trying to raise their kids and raise their family. We have to be cautious and careful that we, that we don't... Um, uh, past legislation that, that unfortunately has those unintended consequences. And we've seen that happen, unfortunately, in the past. Uh, measure 66 and 67, as talked about a little bit ago, certainly had significant unintended consequences as it relates to the flight of capital from our state. I don't think there's any question that um, once, those, once those measures passed, that um, capital, small businesses, if they were able to leave, a lot of them did. And unfortunately, what that means is we don't have the, the dollars that we need to fund our education, to fund our schools, to fund public safety, to take care of the human services needs of our constituents. I look forward to um, the opportunity to engage with you in the, in the Q&A time here. Um, but I just want to plant that point in your mind that the fact that Washington County is the economic engine of the state, and it is, it didn't happen by accident. It happened because you had leaders, both at the state and local level that have worked really, really hard to attract those employers to come here and create the jobs and the economic opportunities and those income tax dollars that come into Washington County and flow out from here. Um, I tell my friends in, from, um, from Southern and Eastern Oregon, that big whooshing sound that they hear, that's, the, that's taxes that are, that are collected or raised here in Washington County and, and flood down the, down the valley and over the Cascades. That's okay, that's a good thing. But we need to have leaders that understand what it takes to know in order to have that economy. It doesn't happen by accident. Look forward to the uh, opportunity for the questions. Thank you. Representative Riley. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the uh, forum for hosting this event and for inviting me. Uh, I am Chuck Riley, and I'm running for state senate. Um, most of you who are here know me. 
uh, and have heard the, heard my bio before, but I'll go through it anyway, especially for our TV audience. Um, I grew up on a small farm in southern Illinois, um, and after that, uh, I went to college, also in Illinois, uh, Southern Illinois University and the University of Illinois, and uh, then I joined the Air Force. Um, it was uh, it was Cold War time, uh, and uh, the first thing I did out of basic training was I actually uh, was sent to Russian language school. Um, and from that, I uh, went back to San Antonio and was uh, um, instrumental there in breaking code in Russian from uh, uh, transmissions that, uh, that, uh, on the Russian radio. So that was an interesting thing. But because I had a uh, security clearance, uh, top secret security clearance, and, and I had a little uh, architecture background in high school and in college, uh, I was offered a chance to actually work on the um, interior uh, of Air Force One the design, on a design team for that. And that was fun. But my final thing in, in, the, Air, in the Air Force was to uh, learn to be a programmer. Uh, so that became my career for the rest of my, rest of my uh, working time. And uh, so I came out, I was a project manager. I moved to Oregon. Um, I was project manager at Blue Cross of Oregon and, and First Interstate, which became Wells Fargo. And um, finally ended up um, uh, forming my own small company. Um, a consulting firm doing uh, project management and programming for these same kind of corporations. Um, my last one was Freightliner uh, before I decided to run for office. And, you know, why did I decide to run for office? Well, I saw there were a lot of things that, that really needed fixing, needed work. Um, we, uh, we had, we needed work in our schools. Uh, teachers were struggling with uh, class sizes. Um, so, you know, I have a record there of work, of, you know, supporting working families. Um, I worked uh, to, to increase school funding. Um, I worked to help small businesses. I actually was voted on that first SIP for Intel uh, and voted yes and would do so again. Uh, but we need to change our focus there. I think uh, the businesses, great big businesses are doing well now, and we need to help the small businesses uh, in the state. About 90% of the jobs in the state are actually small businesses. And, you know, I want to I want to go to work uh, and make sure that they have a little bit less red tape so that they can actually do their work um, and have funding uh, so that they can actually do startups and, and, in, and increasing their business. Um, one of the things I worked on while I was in Salem was uh, to help actually working people was payday loans. Um, we had payday lenders uh, on almost every street corner. And you all remember that. And, and I looked at those and went, there's something wrong here. These people are charging 500 to 800% interest. And so uh, I w worked on a bill to uh, bring that interest rate down. And we, we did do that. Uh, and as a result, a lot of working people who had been uh, victims of these places before uh, are now doing better. Um, I want to go back to Salem. Um, that these are some of the reasons I want to go back. I want to continue working for small businesses. I want to continue working uh, for working people, and and I want to make sure that we fund our schools so that we can get those class sizes down. Um, I was talking to a teacher uh, from Forest Grove, teaches a reading class, 46 students in that reading class. That's unacceptable, and we have to do something to change that. And that's one of the reasons I want to go back. And that's why I'm asking you to vote for me um, for in November. Thank you very much. So I get a couple of minutes to, uh, to rebut, I guess. The, the interesting thing about um, what Representative Riley talked about is um, supporting small business, yet he has a record of raising taxes on small business. So 
and increasing regulation on small business. That's, that's bills he's introduced and votes that he's cast in the, in the House. Um, you know, we, 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 we really do have to focus on small business in this state. We really should cut taxes on small business, and that's exactly what we did last year um, in the governor's, um, governor's called um, grand bargain where we passed an, a number of bills, including the largest permanent tax cut on small business in Oregon history. Um, that is actually helping uh, keep dollars in small businesses' pockets so that they can grow, so that they can invest in their companies, so that they can hire more of our friends and neighbors and family members. So one of the things I actually did was uh, I uh, passed a bill that would allow um, small businesses to get all their state permits in one place. Uh, I was chair of the uh, Government Accountability and Information Technology Committee, and uh, we created a website where all businesses can get all their permits in one place. Time is money, and this saves businesses a huge amount of time. Um, and, you know, it's really important to, to note that um, we, we, we do those, do these things, and um, we talk about uh, cutting taxes, raising money for schools, um, and, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure we do is have enough money for schools, and, you know, Having a $10 minimum tax on corporations, as the senator voted for, uh, is not the way to do it. Um, we need to make sure that everybody pays, pays their fair share. All right, this is time for questions, and the forum is open to questions. The questions are directed by forum members. They're br br brief and concise, and uh, I'll be the judge of that, I guess. Um, so there's something else I was going to say. Oh, introduce yourself by first and last name for the record. So I see John McWilliams there, his forum member. He's going to introduce himself in that manner. Actually, somebody just did. Uh, John McWilliams, forum member. So um, I had heard a little bit ago how Washington County is the economic engine of the state, uh, and uh, I certainly can can agree with what's been going on. Um, there's a lot of people who are living in the, in big houses. Who are a lot of people are going to be coming to work in the DONX plant. All big money people. What about the people who do the serving in Washington County, who are all minimum wage people trying to live here? Um, so what do you think about the, the minimum wage, and if, uh, are we looking for an increase? And if so, how much do you think it should be increased? The president calls for 1010. Uh, Washington, up in Washington, they did $15 an hour. So do you have a, an opinion about how much you should think it should go up, if it should go up? Thanks. Appreciate your questions, both of you. Uh, as was noted earlier, we have the second uh, most aggressive minimum wage in the country, um, but everyone sh needs to have enough um, wage to have a living wage. Uh, we want to make sure that people who um, go home from work, take care of their family, and are able to live a normal life and, and not be struggling every day. To, to a large degree, I agree with what the uh, representative just said. Um, we do have an aggressive minimum wage in this state, um, second highest in the country, and uh, voted on and supported by Oregon voters, and I support their decision. Um, I think, though, as you look at uh, having a healthy economy, we need to have jobs at all levels. And, um, and that's what this economy in Washington County is about. It's having jobs, creating, uh, creating economic opportunity for everyone across the board. Eric Squires, forum member. I ask each of you if you support or oppose a West Side bypass, and if you could briefly elaborate why. This is a, uh, a long time uh, conversation. Um, I would absolutely support a West Side bypass 
if it were politically viable, and I have to stand before you as somebody that spent a significant amount of time, I'm dealing in transportation policy in this state, and I don't see it as something that's, that's really viable to do. What is viable is I think we need to invest in some of our farm to market roads. We need to make those roads safer. Um, they are currently carrying a lot of tra traffic, a lot of transportation. And quite honestly, they haven't been built to handle that traffic. You have corners that are too sharp um, that, should, that you ought to be able to um, maybe uh, ease a little bit. Um, but we should invest in our transportation system in a way that, that makes sense. Um, as you look at the, the long-term needs on the west side, uh, having that connector is important. And we're doing uh, a number of things kind of in the short term. You look at the development um, on Cooper Mountain and South Hillsboro, there's going to be significant transportation investment as parts of that, that in, uh, of those uh, grow, as part of that growth. Um, but I don't see really f an opportunity for a West Side bypass, uh, at least in the near future. So um, I agree with the senator on this. Uh, I don't think it's viable. I don't think we can do it. What we do need to do is we need to continue uh, investing in our infrastructure and creating jobs to do that, uh, not just in Washington County, but all over the state. Patrick Wheeler, former member, just a follow-up question. Front page of the Oregonian last week talked about the traffic issues in Washington County. And I'd like to know is uh, how much would you spend, how would you, to solve the problems, and how would you pay for it? Well, that's a pretty open-ended question. You look at um, the opportunities in, here in Washington County and, and the expansions that we've had are direct results of the work that I've done in a bipartisan fashion in the legislature, the Glencoe Road interchange, the Brookwood Parkway interchange, the expansion of Highway 26 to 185th to three lanes. Um, those are all, uh, we did a bridge program where we replaced a ton of bridges across the, um, a lot of the rivers and, and creeks in Washington County. Um, I will tell you, we will continue to invest in, in transportation in Washington County. I'm, I'm highly engaged right now in a, in a bipartisan collaborative conversation with House members, with Democrats, with stakeholders about putting together a transportation funding package for the 15th session. Um, as you look at how we pay for these things, we pay for them through user fees. Um, you buy gas, you pay the gas tax. That's how we fund transportation in this state. You, um, you buy a vehicle, you pay a title fee. You register a vehicle, you pay a registration fee. Those are all user fees that go to fund and, and invest in and hopefully continue to expand our infrastructure. Um, I think um, Dan Mason mentioned the Cornelius Pass Road situation, a very dangerous road that carries a lot of traffic today. It is the hazardous material route from the Port of Portland into Washington County. Do you like that? Do you like hazardous material being hauled on that road? Curvy, windy road next to a creek? Probably not a great idea. Um, so Senator Johnson and I, um, Betsy Johnson from Scapoos, have worked together. Um, we believe that we'll have the support next year to move that road from a county road currently is owned by Multnomah and Washington County into a state road would allow for me as a legislator to more easily direct dollars to improve that particular piece of infrastructure. We definitely need to continue to, to improve uh, our infrastructure. As I say, it creates jobs and uh, it helps small businesses do their work. Uh, there's no question about that. But you know, it's not the most important thing we have to deal with. Um, it, it may be the most visible, but we really need to work on uh, getting our schools uh, to, to be much better than they are. Uh, transportation cannot be the number one issue in this state. It's one of the best, one of the big ones, but it's not number one. Karen Packer, forum member. Uh, I'd like to ask the candidates what your views are on equal pay for equal work. And uh, in the case of Senator Starr, I don't know whether you've taken any votes one way or another in the Senate, but if you have. Could you use them as an example? Thank you. So I support equal pay for equal work. We have um, 
statute on the book today that you cannot discriminate based on sex, and I would suggest if somebody believes that they have been, that they call the Bureau of Labor and Industries. And I know um, my friend Brad Avakian will quickly return that phone call and engage with that individual uh, or individuals um, and ensure that they are treated fairly. I believe that um, answers that particular question. As a, as a father of a daughter who is a senior in high school and is going to be in college and at some point is going to be in the workforce, I absolutely believe that she ought to be treated fairly in the workplace and absolutely support that. While it's true that there are, there are laws on the books already for uh, non-discrimination, it's still a fact that women make less than 80 cents on the dollar compared to men. And as long as that's the case, I think there's more work to be done and we need to do everything we can to make sure that, that the women in our community uh, are able to take care of their families. They're quite often the only breadwinner and we make, we've got to make sure that they meet, make the same amount of money as men. As long as they don't, there's more work to be done. Harry Bodine, forum member. <clears throat> I was going to ask a question about PERS, but I'd like to sort of pursue this, this last one just for a moment. If, if, what should the legislature do to ensure, beyond what it's already done, that you know, pay for women equals pay for men? I mean, what more can the legislature do on this? Well, you know, we can, we can certainly look at situations where that's not the case and work to make sure that it is. What can the legislature do? Uh, we can work to um, maybe ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, that's a step. Um, and I think that we need, to, we need to make sure that women are treated the same as men. They are not. No matter what the, what the law currently says, they are not. And until they are, there is more work to be done, and you know, we have to do it. The reality is, as Representative Riley just said, there was nothing, he didn't give you a specific at all. Um, didn't say we need to pass another bill, we need to write a new regulation. Ultimately, if the legislature is going to act some way on this, it's going to be some new rule, some new regulation. Well, I suggest we have rules and regulations on the books today. Let's, let's um, enforce those. Um, but more importantly, let's make sure that everybody has a job. Let's make sure we have an economy that works so that when my daughter and my son come back from college someday, that they have a job here. Um, rather than creating more rules and regulation on the so small business um, that we theoretically support represent, in Representative Riley's case, um, let's make sure that we have jobs. I want to address an issue, too, um, related to education. When we talk about supporting and funding education, when Representative Riley was in the legislature voting for education budgets, the Democrat majority systematically defunded or disinvested in education. I mean, systematically, as a percentage of the budget. And, and it's very, very clear. The data is irrefutable. When you look at the percentage of dollars that went to education compared to human services, education got a smaller and smaller proportion of the budget under Representative Riley's leadership and the Democrat leadership in the legislature. I voted no on most of those education budgets because I recognized that in my Washington County schools, it wasn't enough money. In fact, this last year, I was joined by Representative Gallegos and Representative Unger, all voted no on the education budget because it wasn't enough money. You can't go to Salem and vote yes on a budget and then say that, that disinvests in education and say that you support education. Catherine Longacre, new forum member. Um, I hear the word fair share, and I, all, the, all the antenna go up, all, you know, all the alarms go off. The fair share of taxes or the taxes paid by corporations and individuals is currently decided by the legislature. They reward certain behavior and penalize others. If you don't want the legislature to decide who pays what tax, who should pay it, and what is the fair share, especially you, Chuck Riley. I'm not sure I understood the question because, yes, the legislature does decide, and that's who should decide. Um, it's just that I think that, uh, you know, we need to look at it more closely and make sure that everyone does pay their fair share. Well, so a lot of what we decide, what, 
happens in Salem is the legislature deciding the situation on taxes, but we also have the initiative here in Oregon that has, um, you know, voters have voted, voters have made decisions about how they want the tax code and tax system to uh, be um, organized, and so, um, you know, we have, to re -rec we have to be cognizant of that fact as well. I believe that um, we look at our tax system today um, and there's a lot of conversation, a lot of controversy about it. One of the big issues that, that I believe is, a, is bad for Oregon today as it relates to our tax code is, is the disincentive for folks to invest here. We have highest in the nation in capital gains tax. We have flight of capital. Um, people would, that have dollars to invest, unfortunately, too many times don't invest in, in Oregon, they invest in Idaho or invest in other states that are adjacent to us. I think that's unfortunate and damaging. When we have a conversation, and I believe that it's something that the governor wants to have, uh, a conversation about tax reform, um, my hope is that part of that conversation is about how are we going to drive investment to Oregon? How are we going to create incentives so that those dollars that people have to invest are invested here. Why? So that we continue to grow an economy, so that we have the opportunity for jobs, so that folks that are coming through our schools can, can have a place to go to work. This is a television program, and I think we're getting close to our time. And uh, basically, Joseph Tyner and uh, Eric Squires do our, a lot of our stuff here today for the technological reasons. So they asked me to limit it. We're going to have more questions, so uh, if the candidates are willing, that they may they, probably less than that, whatever you'd like. But it'll be off t off the camera. The Washington County Public Affairs Forum wraps up our Monday meeting. We had. Um, we had the first House District candidates um, for the Hillsborough area, um, Representative Gallegos and his challenger on Dan Mason, and Senate District 15, incumbent Bruce Starr, and a challenger, Chuck Riley. And thank you for your attention, and we're on cable TV. We're also streaming, streaming on the internet, and uh, the records are fairly easy to get, so thank you very much for your attendance here. And I think John McWilliams has another question, if the candidates are interested. Um, thank you very much, John McWilliams, for member. Um, I have a question for Senator Starr, and uh, this uh, question uh, is a little bit environmental, too. Uh, um, so I was wondering, um, how do you feel about um, having uh, chemicals in, in uh, manufacturing, uh, manufacturers putting chemicals into children's toys that may not be good for them? Um, do you, have uh, a, do you oppose that? Or, do you have a specific on that? Uh, you know, I'd love to have a specific. I, I don't have a specific on it. Um, I, I don't know where you are. In that. Maybe BPA, you can even talk about the EP, the bottle bill, or you know, when the chemicals in the bo children's bottles or whatever. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not specific on that issue, but I'm just kind of curious as to where you are on, on manufacturers. Uh, I, 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 I believe that um, you have um, chemicals in virtually everything that is manufactured today. Um, that table, this microphone, this podium, um, all have chemicals in it. If you have a situation where children are being harmed um, and it can be proved, I will guarantee you that the legislature will act to, uh, to, uh, to address those issues. And not only that, but those, those toy manufacturers will likely go out of business and go out of business in quick order because someone will sue them. Um, but if, if you can prove that there are to chemicals and toys that are harmful to children and harming children, where children are, are getting sick or dying or whatever, if that could be proved, the legislature would act and I would vote and support that in a heartbeat. I don't believe that's the case. Yep, Senator Starr doesn't believe that's the case, and that's why you voted against the bill to uh, take BPA out of, out of uh, sippy cups and, and babies' bottles. Um, we definitely need to protect our children, and any harmful chemicals that are found to be in it need to be uh, removed. Uh, people, the, the companies have been, after we uh, passed that bill, they've been taking um, BPA out of products, and they haven't gone out of business. Uh, they've just made things healthier. Harry Bodine, former member with a second bite of the apple. <clears throat> the Beaverton School District, I read recently, I believe, saw its PERS contribution requirement double over a four-year period. This means fewer teachers in the classroom because more money has to go to support PERS. 
I also understand that the PERS uh, actuarial reserve is about $10 billion short at this point, give or take a billion or two. So the question is, what more should the legislature do to try to bring this as, into some sort of a balance? Well, first of all, the legislature has already made, done several measures uh, about PERS, um, and PERS is in the process of correcting itself right now. Um, it was a, when the economy went south, as it did for everybody, um, it, uh, it hurt the PERS reserves. But they are increasing. We're getting closer and closer to being uh, even right now. So thank you for your question. What Representative Riley didn't mention is where he stood on, on those PERS votes. Um, we did uh, vote to uh, reform the PERS system as part of that grand bargain and special session that the governor called um, last year. Um, and because of those votes and um, some work that previous legislature had done a decade earlier, um, we are in some regards riding that ship. And I give credit to um, the Oregon Investment Council uh, in their investing of those PERS resources. Um, the reserves, the, un the, the um, unfunded actuary liability is actually going down, and the reserves are going up, and I think that's a good thing. That is a, really a direct result of the work that the, uh, of the economy, one, good investing, too, but work that the votes that the legislature cast. Now, um, the work that we did has been challenged in court, and we will see whether the court will uphold the work of the legislature or not. And if the court overturns what the legislature did, and I supported, then um, quite honestly we'll have a very difficult conversation again because those costs go directly to our local governments, county governments, and school districts. And um, it will be, it'll be very, very difficult for us to uh, manage that if the court overturns what the legislature did. Gee, I don't know. Sure. <laughs> this is a real quick one. <clears throat> the measure on the ballot to, to open the primary to, to voters who are not Democrats or Republicans. For it or against it? You're, the, you're talking about the measure 90, the top two? Is that correct? I support the measure. I think it's, uh, it's a positive for Oregon. I think it'll bring more folks to, into the political process, so I support it. Um, I actually oppose that measure. Um, what it would do is keep all minor parties out of the November election. Uh, we'd have fewer choices, not more. Um, I actually support a whole different system uh, called instant runoff voting. Um, and that's another conversation, but um, I'm opposed to Measure 90. Yeah, I, I can, I'm, I'm post-surgical a little bit, so I forgot the thing I'm always supposed to say on TV, but I'll say it right now. Future programs. We've got, um, uh, next week we've got marijuana coming up. Josh Marquis is, is going to be here um, representing the DA associations and some law enforcement groups. Earl Blumenauer may appear. We, someone from the uh, pro group will be there. Then we've got the first congressional candidates on the 6th. On the 13th, Ted Wheeler is going to talk about his school initiative. Steve Buckstein from Cascade Policy Institute is going to um, state the other position. Uh, the, the Measure 88, which is the alien license thing, Jim Ludwig, the chief petitioner, is going to be there. We're attempting to get the, chief, the um, former Hillsborough Police Chief um, to, to uh, give his position on that. That's Ron Louis, but someone from CASA will be here. So we've got a full line of um, programs. We've left October 20th open for a reason. We think that maybe the Senate candidates or the gubernatorial candidates might come, but otherwise we were booked up. And there are seven, un seven races in this county who weren't, that no one ran for. In our citizen legislature, we have some contested races which are gonna affect leadership and other types of things. So speaking on behalf of the forum as um, a public uh, spirited body, thank you for running and thank you for your contributions and thank you for being here today. Thank you.